Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of our weekly think tank for Monday, 22nd March. My name is Carl Kamalingua. I'm the market analyst over here at Think Markets, and it is a pleasure to be joining you on what is a bit of a soggy morning in some parts of Australia, a very, very warm one over here in Perth, though. Hey, let's uh, stop talking about the weather. Let's start talking about the Think Markets difference, which is substantial. $8 flat rate trades, your own holder identification number, unlimited phone support, and of course, no hidden platform or subscription fees for fantastic reasons why you should make sure your next ASX share trade is with Think Markets. The agenda for this morning's session is to check out those key market moves from around the world. For last week, we'll see what's going on in the COVID side of things, see what happened with respect to the macroeconomic data last week. What do the brokers say about key stocks on the Australian market? Where is the value on the Australian market? Check out some of the key charts from last week and then have a look to the week ahead. Okay, let's kick off with what happened on the ASX last week. We saw a close to 1% fall on the headline ASX 200, but when you dug a little deeper, there were some underperformers there. Energy was definitely one of those materials. The other, uh, we saw continued weakness in uh, key commodities like iron, all that hurt the material sector, and quite a sharp fall in oil prices as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, 4% fall for the material sector and 25 for energy. Financials have had a fantastic run recently. They pulled back just a little there, and there may even have been some uh, dividends coming out, to be fair, which uh, caused a 0.6 of a percent fall. Uh, on the upside, we're looking at some good moves in gold, up 2.9 percent. There's very tiny bouts in the gold price, so good to see some of those gold miners coming back. Healthcare up 1.3 uh, percent. Some weakness in the Australian dollar, I think, help, helping there. Uh, property trusts up about 1.4 percent. Telecommunications up about 1.8 percent. Utilities up 2%. The Australian Volatility Index down 7%, which uh, means that investors are a little less concerned about things than they were the week before, but uh, that not reflected in prices. Uh, well, what's causing some of those concerns at the moment? It's higher interest rates and the fact that rates are rising sooner and faster than many had thought. Now, in terms of the sooner, most of the big research houses had predicted a move up in rates in late 2021, early 2022, as the economies recovered from the coronavirus pandemic. As vaccines were rolled out, as stimulus measures took hold, uh, that's when the economy was expected to recover and therefore uh, you know, inflation was expected to move back up. And uh, we know that bond yields, or they're all about being compensated for inflation down the track. So yes, bond yields are expected to rise but a little bit later. So what's happened, in actual fact, is that bond prices have spiked here at the start of 2021, and they've gone up quite sharply. So from around about 0.6% on the Australian 10-year bonds to nearly 2%. So that's about a 1.4, 1.5% increase in long-term yields. Now, the problem with that is uh, market yields, so the yields that you and I pay on our mortgages, that businesses pay on their loans, are set largely based upon those long-term yields, not at not based upon what the Reserve Bank is doing at the very, very short end of the curve, up to three years. Uh, so if your uh, borrowing costs are going up, that's going to hurt your profits if you're a business. It's potentially going to crimp your spending if you're a consumer. And that's a double whammy for business as well, because uh, if we don't spend, it hurts their revenue line. So if it's hurting their cost line, uh, it's hurting their revenue line, that's a, that's a big hit to profits potentially. So markets are concerned about these rising rates. The other problem is uh, we've got this thing called a discount rate when we value shares. So analysts like myself, we do these discounted cash flow uh, valuations where we discount future cash flows back to a, a current price, current valuation for the company. We compare that uh, current valuation to the share price and we determine whether the company is cheap or expensive. Now, long story short, the higher the discount rate, and discount rates are rising with these long-term yields, uh, the lower the valuation that can be sustained by that discounted cash flow analysis. Uh, and that means, more generally speaking, that uh, companies can be less highly valued as a result of these rising yields. So what's that, a triple whammy now, potentially, for rising rates? So it is important. Um, let's cut all the, uh, the rhetoric here and let's talk about where they could go. So that's what the charts do. Uh, cut through all the words and, in a picture, tell us what might happen. 
clear long-term downtrend. I've got 25 years worth of data here on our long-term interest rates. And we can see that generally they've been falling because uh, you know, inflation has been brought under control by central banks over that period of time. And that's facilitated a great period of economic growth. And as we know, uh, fantastic moves up in share prices as well. That doesn't mean that they can't go back up and from a very, very, very low base. And that's the, that's the thing. They've started at a very low base uh, this time around, below 1%. Uh, you know, historically, we've never been there. So some sort of move back up uh, was to be expected. Where can we go? I think 2.3%. I've drawn a bit of a band there. Uh, where there, If this was a chart of a, a stock, for example, we'd be saying there's potential resistance there on the chart. Now, this, these are yields, so there's no point talking about support or resistance. This, this is the opposite of what the bond price is doing. So bond prices, uh, you, well, for every bond you have a yield, and when bond prices go up, yields go down. When bond prices go down, yields go up. So what we're actually seeing here in this chart is a move down in bond prices, okay, which is sending yields higher. So there's potentially some, quote unquote, support there for bond prices around that 2.3, 2.5% level, which means yields probably will top out in that zone. And we're starting to see that longer term trend area come in around there as well, which will probably help keep us down. Now, as we can see, historically interest rates are gonna be low and that is supportive for economic growth and for company profits and for consumer spending as well. So it's an adjustment process, that's the message here. It's going to be a little bit painful in the short term, but in the longer term, I think, it, uh, it's still uh, the, the level of rates we're going to achieve will definitely facilitate um, economic growth and therefore a stronger share market. Okay, we spent a lot of time on that because I think it is important for people to understand what's happening at the moment and how it impacts uh, us you know, personally, our businesses as well. And also this thing here, the, the ASX 200. So how does the Australian market respond to this? And we can see that we've had a great flattening of this curve. So we were going gangbusters through here but all of this expected economic growth, the um, great stimulus measures that have been um, applied to the global economy, the, the vaccine rollout, some certainty in the White House, and we were going gangbusters and ready probably to go up again through here and rates spiked. And that has absolutely flattened out our um, uptrend. Yep, our short-term uptrend is now flat. You can see there from the orange uh, area here and in, in the short term trends and we use a traffic light system here so green means you know go um, if we go red that means be very uh, very very careful I guess it's probably you want to be um, quite cautious in your approach um, lighten your portfolio positions and then we've got the amber which is you know be concerned about a change one way or the other uh, so we have that short term trend very flat. In terms of the price action, we've gone very choppy. The peaks and troughs, um, it, it, it's very hard to say if they're up or down because uh, some are up, some are down. Uh, and that creates, uh, well, that indicates uncertainty in the market. And we have a, a lot more black candles popping in, certainly than we were when we were um, in, a, in, a, in a more bullish phase. Uh, so there is some supply in the market. Hey, there's some white candles in there indicating there's some demand. There's this great push and pull uh, within the Australian market. Okay, key levels for the week, 66.48. You know, when you're stuck in a range, these key levels start to become very, very important because we move past these key levels, it's telling us that the market's starting to sort itself out one way or the other. Uh, if we were to move below 66.48, I think that would be quite bearish and we could then target the 65.17 level where the long-term trend comes in and it's quite possible we hit that level, bounce, maybe retest and bounce again and that could be uh, the point from which we stage the next phase of this bull market would not surprise me one bit, uh, but how are you going to feel if that occurred? Uh, how would your portfolio handle that sort of a move? And potentially to the upside, then let's hope this is what actually happens. Uh, if we move through 68, 61, uh, that would be more constructive for um, a, a return to an uptrend and then 69.38 is really the key level uh, which could take us up to 71.97 which is the all-time high uh, and you know I, I honestly I think uh, we, we're equally likely for either of those scenarios okay let's have a look at what happened around the world pretty flat there on the Nikkei Shanghai composite down a little Chinese government has been taking steps to I guess just cool down some of those frothier, more speculative um, elements of their economy and that's starting to have an impact on the share market. The Hang Seng, however, uh, shrugged that off. They were up 0.87%. In the US, it was a pretty tepid week, a little bit up, a little bit down, uh, but maybe 
let's say a little bit more down by the end of it. Uh, interest rates still the sole focus of their volatility index up 1.2%, not a whole lot in Europe, a bit of a mixed bag there, the FTSE and the CAC down, but the German DAX looking pretty good actually. They made an all time high during the week, up 0.82 of a percent. Have a look at those commodities. Uh, they were going gangbusters over the last few weeks as interest rates have risen. Uh, tempering maybe you know some of the, uh, the some of the speculative enthusiasm here. Uh, we have seen uh, a bit of a mixed bag. Okay, aluminium though had a very good week, up nearly five percent. Nickel, good to see that bouncing back a little bit. That's had a pretty tough month. You can see down 17.2% still for the month, but up 1.6% during the week. Zinc bounced back a little. You can see they've had a tough month as well. Otherwise, uh, the ones we do watch closely there, copper, copper's, we call it Do Dr. Copper. That's usually a really good indicator of global economic growth down. A little for the week, but still up for the month and well up for the last 12 and then iron ore. Very important for us over here in WA, but also for the rest of the country. Uh, we saw that down 0.47% in, uh, in Shanghai, and we can see some of the troubles that iron ore has had. We haven't said that a lot over the last 12 months, but certainly over, over the last month. Uh, there has been a pullback because that has been one of the areas targeted by the Chinese government. It was down 0.4% in Shanghai and then 0.9% in the US dollar price. But interestingly, the US dollar price has been pretty solid in comparison to what's going on in Shanghai. We did see it bounce back in some of those precious metals. Uh, all the talk is about this iron ore price. So let's have a look at a chart of it. And this is uh, the Dalian Commodity Exchange in Shanghai. This is their benchmark May contract. And the pricing we're seeing here is in yuan per ton. So when we see 1,005 as the key support level here, that is 1,005 at yuan per ton. And if we were to break that, I would be very concerned. I mean, there's still a possibility we can come in as low as 950 and still be in the uptrend, uh, but I would not like to see that. We are seeing some signs of a rally here in the candles, um, a few white candles through and a few lower shadows, uh, which is indicative of some demand coming here. And we're hoping the demand comes in here because it has done uh, in the past. And we have seen strong rallies out of this zone previously. Uh, so all is not lost for iron ore, but we do want to see it pick up very quickly, hopefully get back above 11.26, but that would, that would indicate that we're back in this short-term uptrend as at least, uh, which you can see is under a lot of pressure. Uh, the Fortescue chart looks very similar to this one right here. So if you're holding Fortescue shares, you're wondering why you've seen such a big drop in, you, in, in those shares over the last few weeks. It's because of this BHP Rio. Uh, Rio in particular has come back quite a bit. It's all because of this. Uh, BHP has been spared a little bit because of this move here in energy prices. Generally, over the last month, they have been moving higher. They're up a fair bit for the last 12. But during the week, we had some data saying that inventories were higher, um, that we had Russia threaten the US. I mean, the US has been, there have been rumors and uh, going around. Biden's had some words to Putin. Putin's had some words back to um back to Biden, but uh, the rumors going around about potential sanctions uh, from the US on Russia and Russian, uh, Russia has, uh, again, uh, they've churned up their own rhetoric uh, and the theory is there that they could flood the oil market uh, and push oil prices down and that would hurt uh, US producers as well. It would help a lot of us in terms of uh, what we pay at the, at the petrol pump though, so I'm not sure if they'd, they'd follow through on that it would probably hurt them uh, more than that would hurt the US, I would suggest. But anyway, that has rattled the energy markets and we did see some big falls there. Uh, lower iron ore prices, lower energy prices, certainly not helpful for the Australian dollar. That was down 0.3 of a percent as the US dollar more generally rallied during the week. And it's all about bonds, isn't it? We talked about them extensively at the start of this presentation. And you can see some of the moves up that we've had in yields, uh, both last week, 14 basis points. Now, when the Reserve Bank um, cuts or raises rates, that's usually by 25 basis points. So we've had, you know, the better part of, a, of an interest rate hike during the week. And that's why markets get a little bit cranky uh, up 10 basis points in the US. It will still be the focus this week as well, no doubt. Okay, we talked about uh, the fall in oil prices. Here's a chart for you. And we can see that we have had this wonderful green zone through here. Green means go. That's your short term uptrend. And the long term trend also has swung back to up. So very constructive there for energy prices. And it was all going pretty well until this big black candle 
here on Thursday. Uh, a pretty solid response on Friday. Now, you know, a, a more solid response would have been getting all the ground back, but it is a constructive start. I don't think all is lost here for the oil price. Uh, it's not good that we did close beneath that level. It shows that there is quite a lot of um, selling pressure in the market. Um, the fact we got back in there very quickly is a good sign. Look, if we can get back above, I'd say sort of 64, get back above where the trouble started, that's usually a pretty good sign uh, that the trouble is behind us. So look, watch that sort of 64, 64, 50 level. If we're back through there, um, you know, breathe a sigh of relief for your uh, oil companies. If we stay down here, if we stay down here for a prolonged period of time, it tells us that that supply that caused that initial move is still there. Uh, demand is shifting from buying this long-term trend to being concerned about it and probably offloading a bit of risk. Uh, and then we could see sort of this move here and then down again. And we could target into this long-term zone here. So uh, it's it's yeah, do or die really this week for energy prices, and uh, therefore um, what could happen to your energy stocks. So keep a close eye on that. Now, something we keep a close eye on is how we go. We're going this crisis. Uh, we seem to lurch from crisis to crisis, don't we? For this COVID crisis versus the global financial crisis. Now that's the orange line, and this time around we're the light blue line, and you can see how uncannily similar they are. I mean, these things are, what, 10 years apart, and yet markets have moved almost lockstep in terms of timing and magnitude in that period. Quite extraordinary. Now, if you believe this, we're um, maybe uh, gonna have a tiny little downturn here and then a nice move higher. Will it happen? Hey, who knows? These are just crazy prognostications, aren't they? There's no reason why they should be the same, but they are. Okay, COVID uh, cases, uh, we would like this European one to come down a little bit, potentially to facilitate a rally here. It's uh, frightening to see this third wave, as they're calling it, come back in. Um, obviously, uh, we can see India having some issues down here. Um, some of those European countries, I think uh, Italy is flattening out, actually, that's a good sign, but we're seeing Spain on the way up, uh, under control. Fingers crossed for now in the US, a flattening of a curve there as the vaccines start to uh, get rolled out. Australia and China seem to be under control. Uh, but we're just looking for, is there any um, potential uh, derailment of this recovery process in that chart? And uh, apart from Europe, I don't think that's the case. Okay, some of the data out during the week, biggest data uh, on a monthly basis, without a doubt for any country, is their employment data. Hey, if you're... Um, gaining jobs in an economy that is such such a bullish sign that businesses are confident that people are confident to go out there and look for jobs and then it flows back into economic activity um, the governments get uh, uh, higher taxes and that helps them uh, help the economy as well so it is a really really important data release and it's very important to see that we created 88,700 jobs during the month of February, uh, that was way ahead of analyst expectations for only 30,000 jobs to be cre created and well ahead of January's number there of 29,100. Also encouraging to see, uh, we can see employed persons there uh, in total and full-time workers, but uh, most of that gain coming from full-time workers. So that is showing a very, very confident uh, business sector out there. The unemployment rate that dropped to 5.8% from 6.34%. It's not often you say we had, you know, a 50 basis point drop in that unemployment rate. Uh, and that was uh, even as the participation rate picked up a little. So a double whammy sign of strength there for the Australian economy. And uh, you now that's going to feed back into, into company profits and you know, through uh, retail spending, consumer uh, through consumption later on at some stage. So good news there. Uh, not so great news. We're having a bit of a pause in retail sales. Um, there were some lockdowns. So there were some spot lockdowns, uh, certainly here in my state of WA, uh, but I think in Victoria as well. And that just put a bit of a dampener on those um, retail sales down 1.1%. That was below expectations and below the previous month's print as well. Have a look at some of the data out in China. We, have, we call it the data dump where we get uh, fixed asset investment, industrial production. In the next two we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and you can see maybe why the Chinese government has taken some steps to just uh, cool things down. They don't want to see things overheat. They don't want to see you know inflation uh, come back into their economy and then you know wreak its negative effects. But we saw some um, some crazy huge numbers come out during the week. And whilst they look crazy huge, actually that uh, fixed asset investment was less than expected. So we were expecting this big bounce back 
uh, in the Chinese economy. Um, huge spike here. And don't forget, um, it's not just base effects, of course, it's uh, the, 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 we came back from Chinese New Year, so we've really got, um, you know, really two months worth of uh, data uh, in, this, in this printout here. So it was all um, around about expectations, but um, slightly ahead there on at least uh, retail sales and industrial production. Uh, the unemployment rate actually popped back up a little bit. That's interesting. We'll be watching that situation quite closely, higher than expected and uh, about 0.5% higher. So moving in the opposite direction to the Australian situation. Heading over to the US, uh, we'll just whiz through these. The conference board, well, that was um, still on the, on the up, but um, a little bit flat there, slightly behind expectations. Uh, US retail sales came in at minus 3%. Now, they had some uh, some pretty bad weather over there. So some whiteouts in Texas. You would have seen the news on that one. Uh, COVID is still uh, creating some issues, but um, I think mainly the weather to blame for that one. So I don't think market's getting too concerned about that just yet. But, uh, you know, it puts us on notice. We do need to keep an eye on it because it was actually still worse than expected. Uh, US housing market has been powering their recovery. So we do watch this one quite closely and, and not great data coming out here. So we're seeing a little bit of a tick down on the um, National Association of Home Builders index to 82. That was worse than expected and down from the previous month's 84. And then we've got uh, building permits and housing starts. So uh, permits coming down from uh, you know 1800 to 1600 odd and starts coming down from uh, 1584 to 1421 and uh, pretty steep downturn there but it also probably impacted by uh, some of the weather that we just discussed. Have a look at the uh, weekly unemployment claims that they were worse than expected 770 versus the 704 uh, slight uptick at the end but they are stuck uncomfortably high continuing claims also starting to flatten out now that just below that five million level and this is why uh, the federal reserve is going to keep interest rates steady at these very very low levels and continue their bond buying program the uh, the quantitative easing quantitative easing program uh, and that was uh, announced during the week as well so if you look at where the economy is fed is saying there's still plenty of slack out there there's still plenty of work that needs to be done and they are going to keep rates as low as they possibly can until inflation has moved above their target range. They're prepared to you know, give a little on that uh, to get as much as they can out of economic growth and bringing unemployment down. Okay, during the week we talked about those uh, oil prices, a little bit ironic because we saw Citigroup uh, and UBS come out and upgrade their oil price forecast for the week. Uh, so if we just grab the numbers here, Citigroup, they went from uh, 59 to $64 a barrel US for the rest of 2021. And UBS went from 57 to 65.50, so an even bigger move there. And for, they gave us some data for 2022 as well. So they're, they've gone from 60 to 62 for FY22. So that is you know, indicating a bit of a moderation in this rally in the medium term anyway. Uh, but then we saw that big, big downturn in the oil price. So, um, you know, energy companies, a bit of a push and pull there. They, they were looking pretty good uh, at the start of the week and then looking not so good by the end of the week. But having a look at some of these broker calls, based upon those changes in their assumptions for the oil price, we saw Citigroup raise the beach energy uh, target price from 173 to 175, maintain their neutral rating. Uh, they said that earnings for beach energy should rise by about 7% for FY21 and FY22. In terms of Origin Energy, they bumped earnings forecasts up by 5% and then by 26% for FY22, retained their buy and increased the price target from 550 to 560, I should say, that is UBS in this case. On Oil Search Citigroup, uh, they went up from 435 to 447, retained their neutral rating. Uh, they said that uh, Oil Search is their top sector pick. UBS, very interesting here. You just, uh, you might have been thinking, hey, Oil Search looks good from Citigroup, but uh, it is UBS's least preferred sector pick. How about that? Uh, but all, UBS did raise their price target from 450 to 460, retained a neutral rating and upgraded their earnings estimates by 10 and 50% for FY21 and 22 respectively. Santos Citigroup 735 to 742 retained a neutral uh, top large cap sector pick for them. Uh, UBS on Santos retained their buy rating and price target went up 30 cents to 820. Uh, that is that is UBS's top sector pick. Cenex Energy, uh, 43 to 44, small tweak there, but we've still got a buy from Citigroup, upgraded their earnings as well uh, on the stock 
by 8% for FY21, 11% for FY22. Woodside, the, uh, the, the big daddy of them all, isn't it? Uh, 2591 to 2620 at Citigroup, retained their neutral rating, upgrades earnings by 5% for FY21 and 14% for FY22. And then we've got uh, UBS uh, upgrading their rating actually from neutral to buy. That's impressive. Uh, price target going up to 2670. And they said that the energy price rises have de risked the earnings outlook for Woodside, hence the upgrade. And it is an improved value proposition. And you know, it's probably worth um, pressing pause here and having a look at through uh, some of those increases in the earnings. And you can start to see how sensitive some of these companies are to those increases in prices. And clearly, the biggest one there, I saw a plus 26%, uh, plus 50% here. Um, 23%. So, you know, all such clearly has a lot to gain from that move, as does Origin Energy. Okay, I've put the data up for Santos. <laughs> Trust me, it's Santos. I know it's under my picture there. Um, we, we, you know, we can only fit one on that little panel there, but we've got an average rating of a buy with two strong buys, six buys, five holds, one sell. The mean estimate for Santos is 765, and that will probably go a little bit higher given uh, that some of these ratings have notched up. This data provider takes a few days to catch up, uh, but then that compares you know, pretty well to the 715 we've got here. In terms of the fundamentals, the PE is not outrageously expensive and it is coming down because we do have some growth in the business here in the PEG. That is good to see. Uh, by the way, anything below one is good. Dividend yield is not great, but uh, is expected to get better. Uh, price to free cash flow is, is excellent. Uh, book value is not bad, return on equity is a bit uh, soggy but uh, is on the improve there they've had a tough time in 2020 haven't they uh, with what happened with the pandemic and all prices uh, but look you know I'm, I'm going to give that a, a tick it's certainly a tick here um, that's not the chart of Santos by the way that's the energy sector chart there which is really looking quite flat it's taken a bit of a dip on the oil price move during the week but I think as long as this level holds it's constructive for you know a resumption of the uptrend so look I'd, I'd be hanging on to my energy sector place at this time Let's have a look at where the value is at the moment. So in terms of the, the overall market, we're at about 18.36 on our one year forward PE. That compares favorably to the rest of the world. So Australia looking pretty cheap. That's always helpful. If we have a look at the individual sectors, we can see the materials sector has actually gotten a little bit cheaper over the last month or so because of the downturn there in some of those share prices. So earnings expected largely to be the same. Uh, the energy sector, we talked about that one. It's not the cheapest, but it's certainly not the most expensive. Financials, uh, the second cheapest there at 16.3. Uh, that trend is really the only sector that has any momentum at the moment. And IT is probably the other one to point out with its eye-wateringly high 61 forward PE, uh, but that is a little bit cheaper than the previous 73 from a month ago. Uh, so value is still in the materials and the financials, not so much in IT. What about uh, where does the market stand from a technical perspective? For what we're looking at here is a, a, a chart or a graph of how many companies are trading above their moving averages. So five period moving averages, 10 period moving averages. Uh, that's one month here. Uh, this would be three months here because you, when you think about this, 21 trading days in a month. Uh, and this is one year over here. And we can see a general decline towards the shorter end of the curve and a general decline over the last month. So you can see uh, the market has been weakening. There's been fewer stocks participating in this rally than we had a month ago. That's uh, obviously a result of that softening in, the, in some of the charts of the index we saw earlier on. Uh, it's not good. It's not a good sign. Uh, generally, we like to see uh, in a good bull market, and this is the pre-COVID at the record high there of 71.97. This is what we looked at, looked like here, and we are we are losing ground on that benchmark. Hey, we're way ahead of where we were at the bottom of the COVID crisis when we made that um, that low swing low in the market. So that's good good news. But um, I don't like to see this thing heading this way, and also this thing heading down. So. A little bit of a cautious approach, I think, still required for us at the moment. Okay, let's have a quick look to the week ahead. Pretty quiet week for the Australian market. As you can see, nothing on Monday, nothing on Tuesday. And then we've got our flash manufacturing and services PMIs coming out on Wednesday. Uh, the rest of them are not even worth mentioning because the market won't move on them. In the US, uh, core durable goods orders, they are 
always important for me to look at durable good as something that lasts for a very long time and it's typically quite expensive and you know businesses buy them we buy them governments buy them you know it could be a new fighter jet or a tank or something like that we're not going to make those purchases unless we're pretty confident about our situation going forward so it is a, a wide reaching data release and it's also very forward looking uh, so that's a big one. Uh, final GDP, well, it's final, so we've had the preliminary. I don't think that's going to be too interesting. Look, manufacturing and, and, and services PMIs, they're definitely watched by markets. Uh, but I'm going, getting to the point, I'll just go to the next page, core PCE, that is the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation. Uh, I didn't mean to highlight that one. Uh, personal income and spending, again, very, very closely watched by the Fed and not important there, revised University of Michigan um, sentiment. Okay, so big, big importance to the market, 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 but getting to the point here, all of that will pale into comparison uh, compared to what this guy is going to say and how closely markets will, will look at that. And uh, that, of course, is Jerome Powell, Fed Chairman. And I want to get to the one where there's one here, and maybe it's not, not shown, but uh, I think this one, this is the one here, uh, where Janet Yellen is also going to be speaking uh, to the Senate committee there. And that is, uh, it's the first time it's ever happened. You know, we've got a, a current chairman and a former chairman, who's now the Treasury Secretary, uh, and markets are going to be hanging off e each respective word. My word. We are done. Sorry for going over time, but uh, hey, plenty to talk about today. Uh, if you'd like to catch all of the market updates that we produce, head over to the market news section of the website. You can catch me on Twitter if you like, or the Think Markets handles there. Please get onto the webinar section of the website and register for our upcoming webinars, How to Create an Investing Plan, this Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Then we've got Ask the Experts next week, where you can bring your portfolio to the table for a chat, and then the top three. ASX turnaround stocks on the 7th of April. The disclaimer before I leave you today says that everything we've discussed is general advice. We are a regulated Australian broker. We do have some products that could see you lose more than your deposits. So before you act upon any of this information, make sure you read this disclaimer carefully or give us a call. That's it for me today. All the best for your trading. Until we catch up again, bye-bye for now.